You can see. Hold on, where am I? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So I have a full screen, so I really can't see anybody. But I'll just get going and try to put the pedal to the, not the metal, but go a little quick. So um, I'm going to speak. Um, my name is Barry Nairhus, and um, I've been studying um, Western, Southwestern pond turtles since 2006. And so I originally got involved um, by volunteering with USGS. I did my master's um, thesis studying Western, Southwestern pond turtles, and then now have, um, professionally do research and, and uh, uh, conduct studies, monitoring, you know, consulting work on this species as well. So this talk is gonna be mainly laid out as the natural history of the South, Southwestern pond turtle. And it is a candidate to be listed on the endangered species list, which we'll kind of go through. So um, yeah, I'll basically the way it's gonna be set up is going over the details of what do they look like, size, range, distribution, um, and then some studies that I have done um, through Southern California and looking at different data sets to show you um, how to look at turtle populations and, and, and infer their, their health. So characteristics, um, medium, medium size, olive colored carapace, which is the, the shell with a yellow belly or plastron. They're about five to six inches in length, about a pound or 450 grams on average, depending on what population. Um, Actinomies is ray turtle. That should say Polita. I just went through this to make sure I got rid of Mamorata, that which is the old 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 name. But I missed this. So Mamorata means marbled. This is actually the northwestern pond turtles um, name, Actinomies Mamorata. It was split, and we're we're going to be talking about Polita, which means pale, um, and that's referring to the pale um, throat that that the Southern California species have. They can live up to forty plus years. I've talked to some some uh, senior level kind of old timer uh, pond turtle biologists like Dave Germano and he, he has turtles that he estimates to be 70 years old. So they, they can live quite a long time for being such a little, uh, little pond turtle there and in, in these uh, ephemeral waters that, that they live in a lot of times. So there's that olive carapace and, the, um, and then the yellow plastron. You can see all those plates, we call them scoots. So I'll be kind of talking about those a little bit um, when I talk about measuring and things like that. So it's been about the palm of my palm of my hand, um, and then that ray, the ray actinomies, that ray turtle, referring to kind of how the the coloration rays out from a central point here on each scoot. So um, you can see the mamorata, which is the marbled, and it has the, a pale yellow throat compared to the northwestern. Um, another thing that people can look at when they're looking at um, different turtles to see if there are pond turtles or uh, uh, red eared sliders is pond turtles have yellow eyes and sliders have green eyes. Um, that green stripe is a or green stripe, that black kind of stripe that goes through their eyes is a, another, I don't know, indicator for me, but sometimes this red eared sliders will have that as well, which is a non native turtle from the southeast. Um, U.S. Uh, males kind of have a bulbous nose, you can see on the right here, and then females not so bulbous on the left. This is the original range of them. Um, this is 08, so, you know, there's been some changes, clearly. Um, this is the entire species um, of act Actinomies mamorata. Mamorata and, well, Actinomies mamorata and Actinomies polita. Uh, which has now been split. So um, it's been split. Basically, the southwestern pond turtle is south of San Francisco Bay. Um, and, and they probably delineate them from rivers that are not connected to the bay. So kind of down here, there's a lot of different clay. Santa Barbara area has a unique clay. And this is all split up through um, genetics that they use the mitochondrial DNA which is kind of a phylogeographical analysis of where your genes come from. And that is how they um, use that information to tell you where you know, the, the split lines are for different 
um, subspecies or full species. Um, zooming in into like the Orange County area, I'm in Fullerton here. So that's up here. Looks like there's some old little spots here. Um, Chino Hill State Park is known to have pond turtles. Um, one of my mentors, Bobby Goodman, did his thesis there. Um, the UCI marsh, which we'll talk about, um, actually, which I don't know if it is actually on this map. I should get an updated CNDDB map for hot spots on uh, pond turtles, because uh, that should be Costa Mesa, Irvine, right here, which might be one of the largest populations in uh, Southern California. So you see they're, they're kind of like little islands of, of pond turtles here and there. You got Marietta Creek, you know, you got pond, you got um, Pendleton and things like that, um, Santa Rosa Plateau. So there, there's, uh, there's spots, but they're not really, they're, they're really disconnected. So where do these guys live? They live in rivers, streams, rental pools, um, lakes, rivers again, because they love to be in rivers so much, uh, marshes, Estuaries, pretty much wetlands. Um, fresh water, typically, they can handle um, some salt water, some tidal influence. Um, a point, uh, a population of Point Magoo um, was living in um, saline water during high tides. So, you know, turtles' skin is waterproof, so they can handle that, just like our skin is. Um, they like, like basking on logs and emergent vegetation, typically not on the edge of ponds um, because of, to avoid predators. Um, so they have aquatic habitat, but then they also use upland habitat to nest, estivate, which is over summer, like the, uh, go into dormancy in the summer, or and they also overwinter. So overwintering is a term that is used when certain like reptiles and amphibians don't truly hibernate because they actually come in, in and out of dormant of a temporary dormancy or torpor. So that's why we use the word overwinter versus hibernate when it's like there's snow on the ground, they're, they're hibernating. So um, here's kind of a picture of, not kind of, this is a UCI, this is the UCI marsh. This is the, of the UCI marsh we estimate, I don't know, about 600 turtles at this point um, or greater. Um, and I'll show you kind of an overview map of where this is. And this is this this has the densest population within that population of pond turtles. So it just kind of shows that cattail, the cattails there, the open water um, where they kind of swim. And, and usually how we sample is through funnel trapping, which I'll show you. And this shows you how, this, so this is in April. I can tell because you can see the mustard on the hillsides here. Um, and uh, which is, you know, what we're seeing a lot of this year. So early April, mid, probably mid April. And then this is what it looks like in July, just bone dry. Um, but actually, in terms of a marsh ecology, you know, there's a bunch of um, um, Sesuvium varicosum here, which is an, a native ice plant that's flowers and has a, a, a huge array of native bees and butterflies and things like that um, as an anecdote. So here's the UCI marsh. This is where I did my thesis. Um, this is in Orange County, UC Irvine is down to the south here. And um, the, the, let's see, University Drive, we have Campus Drive here. And then this reserve here, um, this kind of yellow line delineates the road. And to the west of it, you have this reserve, which is owned by um, UC Regents. So UC Regents manage all the University of California universities. And so these, all these universities, UCLA, UC Irvine, it's the University of California at Los Angeles or at Irvine or at Berkeley. So the UC regions have all this open space land too, called um, natural res the natural reserve system. And they are throughout California. I don't know how many there are, um, but there's a lot of species in these different areas that um, uh, are kind of like they're, they're harbored in these in these reserves. Um, and these were designed for education and research. So this is where I did my undergraduate here. So that's where I knew pond turtles were here. And then I went and got my master's at Long Beach State. Um, upstream is IRWD and then downstream is Upper Newport Bay. Um, this is kind of Newport Beach over here and then Irvine to the south. So just want to give a general, for anybody local, want to give a general idea. And then the dark, the dark, Polygra um, uh, uh, the dark shapes here of ponds 
is just indicating a, a wet, a wet condition January through June, which is actually the water, the hydrology is it, it IRWD pumps water underneath the um, road here and floods the marsh and through gravity it just flows down in this direction towards the creek but it never enters the creek so it gets a pulse of water in the winter december january february a few pulses um and then there's also an option to there's a pump house down here at, in san diego creek um <clears throat> to pump water but unfortunately with sea level rise um we're getting um, too much salt water on the high tides are getting higher and higher. And it's it's very difficult to pump fresh water in here um, at, at any point. When I was in when I was in uh, at the university, they actively pumped quite often. They still had to check the tides, but um, I guess it's been almost 20 years now since I went to school there and it's uh, no longer no longer viable to pump there. So in the dry season, you can see how dark it is. The dry season, you see how light it just shows how little habitat remains um, and it really changes drastically. It, it, so um, the turtles handle this, you know, so people, the initial study that I did is where do the turtles go? I mean, turtles, they're supposed to be in water, as I mentioned, rivers and streams and ponds. So one of the questions I had with my master's thesis is where the heck they go? Um, the good news is with, with that when it's ephemeral like this, it, it minimizes the overpopulation of invasives. The way that I initially was able to scout where pond turtles were is I built these floats to see if pond turtles would actually, were, you know, would be in the ponds. And that would kind of help USGS um, sample the, the sites um, when I was uh, doing undergraduate research there. So this just shows a picture of one basking on a log and actually they're not that easy to see in a um, natural setting. So uh, really good camouflage and very, very skittish. So it'd be a hundred yards away, you know, and they see you and they'll, they'll plop in the water. So a lot of times when you're walking up to any type of a body of water where you think there's turtles and you hear a plop or something, you know, there might be a turtle there or a few, uh, could be a bullfrog too. So these are highly cryptic animals um, and hard to detect. So visual surveys, in my opinion, are not that, um, effective, even though you can see them, um, but there's usually a lot more there than, than what you can see. So this is um, Point Magoo showing you this is a high tide, and then this is the low tide here, what it looks like. And I just kind of wanted to show you a depict. I didn't have a, when I did this, I didn't have a, a video on, I just took photos, but I released this turtle and it just show you like this male here going into the water and it just it just buries itself right in the mud right there, just showing you like, you know, they're not just, they're, they're, they can be completely just in the silty mud and you, you can't find them. So very, very cryptic. It's always important to understand um, where species nests, where they're, they're birds or, or uh, you know, turtles or, or, or lizards or snakes or whatever, whatever animal is being studied or managed because that's really the recruitment into the population. So the nesting habitat for pond turtles, um, they, uh, it's, it's always in the upland. Um, so they don't lay their eggs in the water or anything like that. Um, they have a hard shell. So that's to prevent desiccation. It's not like an amphibian that's jelly-like. Um, so their nesting season in Southern California is generally April to June. It could be a little bit into, a little bit early as late March and it goes into early July, just in general, April through June. They excavate nests in dry upland slopes, could be grassy field, coastal sage scrub, a road bank, uh, floodplains, grassland, you know, I already said that. So um, basically the upland habitat. It could be hard clay, it could be sandy. Um, I've seen it in, in very hard, very hard um, soil conditions. So they, they, they seem to not, as far as I know, um, I've seen nests in all different um, soils. They lay one to 11 eggs, um, can double clutch, which means they can have two nests within one season. Um, and they typically utilize south to southeast facing slopes. Um, that's a preferential thing, but they, uh, they, um, whatever upland is available, they will definitely use. 
So the average for turtles in Southern California is about five to six eggs. So, so I'd put transmitters on them to find these nesting habitat at the UCI marsh. There's one with uh, a radio transmitter attached with um, nail acrylic. Um, this, these always kept me up at four or five in the morning trying to find those nests. So mean a clutch size for that study, I found uh, over over 20 nests at this site, um, but there were five to six eggs per clutch. This is an x-ray of a female. You can see the eggs here, one, two, three, four, five. So, you know, it really depends on the size of the, you see they're just stuffed in the whole body cavity. So it's probably the size of the turtle that allows for the number of eggs. So this is a turtle at Point Magoo, the transmitter um, uh, excavating a nest. You know, I you know at the time I think I was living in Huntington Beach and I was driving up to Magoo every day or something because you got to go every single day. They don't take Sundays off. They don't take sick days. No PTO, no Memorial Day, and you have to go every day. And you have one to two chances to find this nest. And um, um, you know, so you know when you see it, you're like, oh, thank God. And then it dug a Fake, it, you know, I sat there quietly till nightfall, didn't bother, it didn't disturb it, and it dug a false nest. You know, talk about a heartbreak. So I don't know why, maybe something scared the female. The females are very, very vulnerable at that point. Most shells of older females are um, damaged from tooth marks, from raccoons and coyotes and stuff. So uh, maybe, maybe it, uh, it just spooked off. Um, so this is another nest uh, that I, I found just from like searching around and this is one that was predated maybe by a ground squirrel. So the eggshells are all out of the nest. Um, and this is one that's where the eggshells are in the nest and that's what you would find in a hatching environment. There's no need for eggs to fly out of the nest like that unless they're dug out. So there's actually a couple pond turtles right here. Um, just really stuck in the mud. Like they, they hatch and they have the yolk sac and they just, um live in, live in those um, nest cavities for several months so to answer the question how long do it take for um eggs to incubate uh it's roughly about 100 days you know so that's like you know three and a half months or something like that and and so if you're if you're nesting in in june you know that's going to be october or something and this this was in december and they're still in the nest when i took this photo you can see the little nuggets here. The five, they're all they're like the size of a quarter. Um, and this one right here, I wish I had a video because it was actually, my memory serves me right. It was uh, wiping the uh, dirt from its eyes and seeing light for, for the first time, which I thought was a fairly magical experience. Uh, all by myself, couldn't share with anybody. I'm sharing it with you though. So hopefully you like it. So here's, here's a, Hatchling that um, was found during a construction uh, project. Um, you could see the egg tooth on the um, little the, the rostrum there, the front of the face, and um, about the size of a quarter. And the way they fit in this egg is um, kind of like folds in like a taco, the little taco eggs, little uh, canapes maybe. If you want to think in food like? I don't know if you've had dinner yet. Um, so. You know, another question that people ask is how far do turtles go? Um, how far can they walk? So this is this is how far away they get, they I was able to measure that they nest from the edge of water of the pond that they were in. That's all I could really tell you. So the maximum distance is 457 meters that I measured, which is about which is over a quarter mile, right? Because 400 meters for you track runners, um, everybody ran the 400. That's a quarter mile there. So quite a long distance if you're eight inches long to walk through upland all the way up to uh, figure out to, to dig a nest and then walk back. So quite quite a big feat there. So just shows you in 2010, this was um, uh, 16 nests. I think we I ended up finding 20 nests in, during this study. So their conservation uh, status, um, they have several status. Uh, Stati, statuses. Um, so on the federal and Cal they're federally in California species special concern. Um, however, I think they're 
you know, instead of a species of special concern federally, now they are a candidate to be listed on the endangered species list. Um, in Oregon, they're a species special concern and they're state endangered in the state of Washington. In 1993, it was, um, uh, it was uh, petitioned to be listed and unwarranted the findings by the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, said it was unwarranted to do inadequate information on the species. And what that tells me is there just wasn't enough. It was uh, basically if, so this is where science really needs to come into play with conservation and these studies need to be implemented. Because implemented. if we're just all assuming that things aren't doing well and we can agree upon it, there still needs to be data collected so that um, it's clear that things aren't doing well and there could be a better decision. Because clearly in 1993, the wetlands in the state of California were not doing well. Pond turtles were not doing well, and but there was no information to prove that they weren't doing well. So it was just like, oh, um, they're hard to find. And that's true, they are hard to find. But currently now they are um, a candidate for listing as an endangered species. And this was due to a lawsuit, I believe, by the uh, Center for Biological Diversity trying to as um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife was trying to kind of avoid listing a bunch of different species. There was a long list. I forget the actual specific story, but the spade, Western spadefoot toad and the Western pond turtle ended up being on that list uh, to be reviewed. And now we're all giving them as much data as possible to show that they are not doing well. So reasons for decline, like any class, if you guys ever took conservation or anything, habitat loss. That's the reason for most species decline, unless you're like the condor, it's lead or something. But 91% uh, of wetlands in California have been destroyed. I say let's let Lake Tulare back to life. That phantom lake is growing, and that would help make it maybe 80% remaining or, or remain or uh, you know uh, destroyed. Uh, remaining wetlands are definitely degraded. Um, they're fragmented, which makes it very easily invaded. Um, invasive species pressures. There is evidence that red eared sliders, it's published that red eared sliders will push them out, um, uh, them being the Western pond turtles, bullfrogs, uh, xenopus, the African clawed frog, mesopredator release. If you have an increase in raccoons, and um, that put, uh, puts more pressure on, on uh, pond turtles and their young, you know, the, the young are the most vulnerable. Pollution. Um, fires, fires is a big one. Human consumption, that was like 200 years ago, but there's a really kind of a fun paper um, that uh, Matt Betelam uh, published. He's up in San, San Francisco on, uh, on how there was a, a market for turtles. And they would call them terrapins. So here's a, in terms of methodologies, here's like the floats that I put up just to see if we can find them. I think they could be used for really good educational um, uh, educational pieces for people that do have pond turtles. Um, so how do you catch them? You know, everybody wants to know how to catch them. You can catch them by hand. You can use funnel traps like I'm talking about here. Um, you know, sometimes they're just walking on the road. But what I did is I use uh, nylon funnel traps or hoop net nylon funnel traps. The nylon is the netting. They're baited with mackerel mainly because they're very, very oily, and that's a nice scent for pond turtles to go find them. I would use 30 traps per pond during the study at the UCI Marsh, and would keep them in for four nights only. I wanted to avoid trap shyness because then they start learning that the trap is, is a danger. You can also snorkel, and as I mentioned, hand capture. That's snorkeling, you better do water quality testing first, check out for toe biters, and any leeches, as I have in my great wisdom of encountering all those things. So here's what a hoop net funnel trap looks like um, on the left. So this is these are all built by hand. It takes about eight hours to build one of these things. So they're very precious to me. And on the right, this is kind of a, a small little toolkit of, of transmitters, calipers to measure and scales, GPS of how you do telemetry. So I didn't want to um, lose my boots. So I just jumped in with my feet. You can catch it by hand just like that. Um, and with hoop net funnel traps, you get a better haul here. Um, it would take a long time to catch as many. So pond turtles are on the left. And look at all these invasives on the right. You got bull cat, bullhead catfish, 
and those are all um, clawed frogs. The red-eared slider, this is an older one, um, so old that the red on their um, ear is fades away. It's a large old female. Um, see how the eye is green, and there's a lot of coloration on the shell. And when I see this kind of black dot pattern, a lot of times I definitely think it's a slider. Um, sometimes pond turtles can have that too, but pond turtles never have a light coloration on the carapace. So that's, you know, when people ask me, um, that's the kind of details I'm looking for. Also, if I see any coloration like this, like this light pale yellow or green coming down like this and the striping down the chin, I know that that's not a, a southwestern pond turtle. So when I catch them, I take measurements. Um, this helps me determine the sizes and for ages, um, age and everything there. So there's um, weighing them, depth of shell, counting the annuli. So the annuli are basically rings. So turtles have a growth period where they're feeding a lot, which is right now, they're trying to feed as much as they can. And then by late summer into the fall, their metabolism starts to really shut down. And so their growth, the growth of the pond turtle stops which creates an abrupt ring where it stops growing and then it grows again. So all growing from the, um, you know, this point here on the outside. So I count these to try to estimate age. Now I can't always do it. It's not an exact science, but it does help under, you know, help us understand age and size. And I'll show a photo of that a little bit later. Uh, so there's carapace length. And then here's what happens when you plot it, um, carapace length weight versus carapace length. Um, and you get this distribution. Uh, it's an allometric graph, but what this kind of, this shows me is, is, is the, the frequency and the number of turtles. So maybe some of you have seen this before in other presentations I've given. Um, but basically the findings of my thesis, the take home message is, you know, this is kind of a nice reference of what a pond turtle distribution should look like. You got a lot of young here down in the 50 millimeter, which are typically the smallest carapace length turtles I can catch. And then you have them all the way up into the, you know, 100 and, 150 millimeter, which are fairly 160 millimeter, even with some of the females, which are, which are very large for, for this area. Um, what this tells you that all this graph mainly tells you sexual dimorphic characteristics exist. You can see the males are a different shape than the females in terms of like the mathematics and all of that. So um, San Joaquin Marsh 2009, um, the blue are new captures and the red are recaptures, just showing you kind of the distribution, like, okay, I'm trapping and I'm marking them um, as I was showing how I process them. And then they, they're given individual numbers. And then as I, every year, I was recapturing more, recapturing more, which by the end I was, I captured all of them and I was just getting recruiting turtles, which to me in general, in terms of population means it's a closed population. Um, and then I've, I've pretty much captured them all. Um, recapture percentage, um, just showing over time how that, that grew from 30 to 90, it was pretty saturated. Um, just really quick over telemetry. Um, people, I don't know if any of you have done telemetry before using radio, um, used radio, radio transmitters. You, it's just basically giving you an estimate of, of where they're at. So I would cut, cut nail acrylic and I'd release them back in the wild. Spence, Spence here, he's now retiring. He was, um, he was essential into helping me fund my project. And um, he would basically donated all the transmitters and built them for me um, from his company communication specialists over in Orange, in Orange County. And he even gave me all these receivers for free too. So very, very grateful for all that. He told me I was just basically a, the R and D and the guinea pig to see if it would work on turtles, so he would market it. So I would follow him around. Here's just some data. To me, the radio transmitters aren't very helpful in the water. I can basically tell you that they're in the pond, but they were definitely helpful for nesting. When I would find them at three in the morning, four in the morning, I would just kind of wait to see where they would. I was trying to figure out emergence and stuff, but it's it's really difficult. So there's a female just kind of hanging out after she nested. If you look very closely on the rear end of her carapace, there's dirt and mud there. Whenever you encounter a turtle and there's dirt and mud on the back of their shell and it's a female, it tends to mean that they had just nested. So anyway, um, <clears throat> something I also wanna get analyzed 
um, is these nests that I have at the UCI Marsh. They were nesting in clusters. What the heck are they all going here for? And all going here for? A lot of nest site fidelity going on. And, and, you know, and the reason why is like, there's all this bluff upland habitat. They move past all this other stuff here. Why are they going to the same exact spot? I don't know. We can all speculate and create hypothesis, but at the end of the day, I don't know. I don't have any information, um, but there are circle statistics and stuff like that that maybe can, can answer that question. So um, to be determined. But anyway, it just shows you all the different nests. Look at this cluster here. Kind of shows you when you're developing something or planning something when you have land that has pond turtles that actually throughout this bluff area, this whole area has low value to at least the transmitter turtles that I had um versus how important this is if you wipe that out you might wipe out an entire ancestry of nests that you know but we don't live long enough to understand all of this stuff so look there's these are basically where the where they came from just to zoom in these double clutching so you know looking this is where this is the, the spring and this is the fall again or the summer you know where the turtles went basically they just went right to the edge of the pond they go under trees in the duff. They don't really excavate like a desert tortoise or something, um, a burrow, but they just kind of nestle in and just kind of sit there in, in cool, moist areas. So they didn't really travel that far. They just kind of traveled as to the closest available habitat that was suitable um, pretty much to the edges of the ponds. Um, <clears throat> so importance for conservation on this is, is making sure that we understand um, making sure we have population estimates. Um, demographic studies are very important um, to understand. Are they reproducing? Are we getting recruitment? Um, I just mentioned the upland habitat use knowledge like, oh, well, they can nest here if they want. It's kind of like, you know, when uh, we make assumptions that a bird will just find another tree if we chop a tree down. It's like, ah, there's a lot more information. And with turtles, we really don't know as much as we should to manage these, at least with pond turtles. Um, you know, knowing those nests, so understanding the population, I believe, is the first step, and then trying to figure out that recruitment and increase that recruitment, increase survivorship of that recruitment. Um, you, so understanding that upland habitat use knowledge could be important for managing the nesting habitat or access to the nest for the adults and access for the neonates or the hatchlings to the water. So that's all very important. Um, Make additional populations. We lost populations. Let's bring them back where we can. We've lost wetlands. We got to create more wetlands and make the wetlands better. That's obviously going to be important. We took things away. We got to put it back. That's the only way we're going to be able to re get recovery. Um, management techniques. Um, this is blunt trauma, blunt force trauma from a mower. Um, and you could tell pond turtles can be tough, but how many turtles get mowed? You know, when you're mowing down vegetation in wetlands, this was at Point Magoo, they mow down the vegetation, um, you know, because they don't want a bunch of birds near the flight line or the, the air, the air, the airstrip there at Magoo. So the, you know, because bird strikes are, are very important, are very um, impactful to aircraft and aviation and cause, cause a lot of damage. So they're trying to manage that, but, you know, you could lift the blade. It doesn't have to be at the ground level. It could be six inches and you be just as effective. But just little things like that can help, you know, avoid the impacts to these turtles. Now, drought, that's another big deal. So the UCI marsh that I'm showing right now was very, very dry. It didn't receive water for several years from the marsh, from the uh, Irving Ranch Water District. And this was all becoming extremely saline and a lot, many, many dozens and dozens of turtles were just found dead. This is me picking one out here that um, was, was found dead, um, really terrible. Um, oh wait, but I was UCI. So I was like kind of panicked at the time, 2017 or 2018. And uh, cause we, it was pretty terrible. And then um, I, found out that they were actually still there, which was super exciting because they did end up flooding the marsh because of the concern that we raised about the pond turtles dying. So, at, at, okay, let's move on. At my thesis, when I did my thesis, we estimated the population with 308 turtles. 
So UCI um, got some funding together to, to get me to get out. Well, I started to go, I went out there my, on my own to figure out what was going on because I cared a lot about that population and they got funding to allow me to study them for two more years. Um, and we ended up estimating um, Lyle Buttermore, who was a graduate student there, um, and I, we, we estimated over 600 turtles from our data there, which means before the drought, there was probably an even greater number. So creating these ponds are important. Um, this is uh, a pond that um, Zach Principe and I designed. He's with the Nature Conservancy, and this is the Santa Rosa Plateau. We actually just trapped this pond today. There are traps in the water. Um, this is Coal Creek at the center of the plateau, and this is this is when it was just excavated. Um, so um, we um, uh, Haley Haley Lasky, who's the works for Center for Ma um, Natural Lands Management, um, hired hired me and my team to uh, assess the population there. Um, we finally got rain. There was, you know, there was a we built those ponds because there was a concern during the drought that Coal Creek was going to end up drying out. And we were going to lose turtles. And this here is Lyle telling me um, how to do my job and file the turtles here. Um, <clears throat> he has uh, become a, quite, the, quite the pond turtle biologist himself now. What I found really interesting here, <clears throat> this was at a, a pond, um, not Coal Creek, but this is Sylvan Creek, which is still on the plateau, the reserve property. Um, how That turtle in po other populations that I've studied would be a two or three year old turtle. But looking at those annuli, I believe this is a five or six year old turtle um, from the annuli, meaning that they were very, it was, they were having a real tough time over the, over the past few years just because of how horrible the drought was. So um, still showing a lot of juvenile characteristics, this long tail, I couldn't, I couldn't sex it based on um, cloacal position or anything like that. So I don't know, I don't know. Um, it just shows the variability in size and whatnot, but that is a very tiny turtle and that would be tough to get an egg if it was an, a male or a female. Um, so this is an older um, chart of turtle populations, the UCI marsh, I estimated, um, 307 in 2015. This can be updated when we estimated in 2020, I believe, um, 600 and 615 or 600 and something. And we're working on a paper to uh, address what's going on over there. Cocklebur, that's a well-studied population by USGS on Camp Pendleton. So they were able to report 119 turtles and we're giving confidence intervals, which helps you know, give an understanding of, of what's going on with these populations, the maximum likelihood. Um, Chino State Park, 51 in 1997, that is very old data. I don't know if anybody's been over there to assess the population, burning 08. West Fork of the Sangue River, 146, that was Bobby Goodman's um, thesis, but we only, um, the, the Bobcat fire just wiped out that area in 2020. And um, USGS brought a team together, which Lyle and I were a part of, um, to rescue turtles and before it silted, before the large rains. So what happens is a fire comes in, burns all the vegetation, then there's just silting, or then there's just bare soil, then the rain comes in the winter, and all that loose soil and ash flows into the creeks and buries the creeks and turns into just mud and, and no water flowing anymore. And we were able to, um, we pulled out unfortunately 11 turtles and they're still at the San Diego Zoo. Um, but uh, hopefully some survived, I, I'm not sure. Irvine has um, 84, this has been a declining population. And then a few populations in, in uh, the Mojave River that are very, very small. So th these are all over the place. And um, there's probably a little bit more information now. Um, I don't have the Santa Rosa Plateau on here. There's a few other populations, but it, it, it's pretty, pretty. Uh, they're disjunct and also isolated. And uh, the populations are, are, you know, stochastic of events will just take them out, just like you learn in conservation biology. So this is an example, again, like I mentioned, like a nice 
healthy, full population of all different sizes and lots of females, lots of males, lots of juveniles. Point Magoo, this is what you would call a relictual population. This is the population that is not, there is not a survivor, there is not recruitment coming in. So you saw that we had the 50, 50 therapist link. Yeah, look at over here. It's gone. Doesn't exist. I wasn't catching anything. But I caught all these adults. And all that's showing is they're, and they are breeding, they are breeding, they are mating, they are laying eggs because I followed them and I felt them they're grabbing, they were trying to lay eggs. There's just no survivorship going on there. No recruitment or very, very little. And if you grab this, it, you know, it more than likely is on its way out. Relictual populations means they've, they're just adults. They're living, they're not breeding. And we might, we, if nothing's done, well, they will be lost. Aliso Creek, this is a, uh, we're working on a paper at this population as well. Um, this is in Orange County. What was interesting about this population is you had this bimodal um, size differential of a lot of old turtles and a lot of young turtles. Um, uh, we even ran some st some statistics. Emma Dressel did a lot of that work, um, the whiz kid with with stats, and we were able to actually prove that it was bimodal, meaning just fem just young here and just old ones. And I was like, well, why? So this was relictual because I had already studied them like that here, and then all of a sudden, because there's this big gap, where are all these turtles? And then I, we, all of a sudden, these were all about five years old. You can see the grouping are, are very similar in size. Um, and when you're young, you wouldn't, wouldn't have that much variability. Um, and I asked the, the landman, well, what happened five years ago? And they removed all the Arunda, which I thought was amazing. And um, so we've been studying this. And you could see that the sizes, you're still getting recruitment from the young, the little ones. And then they're, they're actually growing and surviving. So we still need to do survivorship analysis on these. I think we have, I just, I'm not reporting it in here. And now it's, it's starting to become a nice healthy population. We just trapped it um, last week. We've done two sessions there. There's one more session at Luso Creek to finish the data set for 2023. But it's just showing that this population is recovering. So we have one that's like, okay, this is an old population, looks good. And we got even took a drought on and it was able to handle it. And we had this relictual one that's like, hey, this is down and out, possible to fix it because this is showing you can fix it right here. You change the habitat, you increase survivorship with giving the turtles habitat um, to increase their, that survivorship or change the conditions. And then you can see this recovery that's happening. Now, this is pretty new in terms of recovery. But, um, you know, given that the pond turtles that were uh, adults were very old, I think that they should be doing just fine there. So um, you got to keep monitoring. I, I kind of like the Aldo Leopold approach of, of, of wildlife management that you kind of got to, you got to kind of just be on it for long, long periods of time. I mean, it's kind of, you want to be a steward. It, it really takes a long time to really understand what's happening. And you make these adjustments over time. Um, turtles live a long time and they're pretty resilient. You know, they've been hanging around for 3 million years at this, at this species at least. So a lot longer than we have. So I'm very hopeful if we do a lot of these different things here, we can, um, we can have healthy populations. So just make sure you're managing that aquatic habitat, the nesting habitat. You need emergent vegetation for uh, on the edge of ponds for um, the, the hatchlings. So I don't catch the neonates in my traps because they don't use that habitat. They use um, just really within a meter of the shoreline of creeks and ponds and things like that. And they're just hiding, not being eaten. So I would like to wish you all a uh, happy World Turtle Day. This is actually literally taken this morning. And we caught uh, at this pond, this is Sylvan Pond at Santa Rosa Plateau. And I think we caught uh, 10 pond turtles here, all little guys. But pretty interesting. So thank you very much. I don't know if you guys are actually listening because it's been very quiet. Um, but I enjoyed myself. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I don't know. I know I kind of went over the uh, went over the the uh, time there. But uh, are there any questions or comments or thoughts? reflections. Oh.
Up to what age do the pond turtles live? Uh, they live up to 70 years old, as far as we know at this point. So, so, so like they, social security age for me. Oh, okay. Do they make certain periods of their time when they're young, <laughs> like in their uh, teens, they, their they, mature you know, age? They, yeah, so they start mating, they start showing uh, sexual male and female characteristics when they are like maybe eight years old, depending on the conditions in a normal condition, eight years old. And I think they mate, uh, you know, I don't know as they're getting really old, but I know into their 30s and 40s and 50s, they're mating for sure. So they have little turtles coming out after they meet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's oh, the way it works. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Bear, you have your hand raised. You, got, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, in a slide a little bit ago, you mentioned that turtles all in one location were going to the same place along a pond, I think, to breed. And I was wondering if you have any plans on figuring out why that is, or if not, if you even have an idea of how we could figure something like that out. So there is something I, okay, uh, a quick answer, I guess is yes, but I have to see if I have enough data that will fit the circle statistical models um admittingly i am more of a field biologist and the creative project guy um i passed my stats classes you know i did okay i did all right but i'm not the whiz at that kind of stuff emma dressel who is not on here i don't think um she found a way to use it to to do that analysis on r it's just we haven't gotten a chance to look at that it's in the queue of like six six things happening right now but yeah so i'm hopeful and i would like to report on that and create a, a paper on that as well do you have any any guesses right now uh what it might be like so the only so the only that? thing circles so the only thing circle statistics will tell me is there is this, yes they are sing, they are utilizing specific areas um statist that are statistically significant it would be basically that it's a non-random movement like they are going there on purpose so um i don't think that's been proven before but through observation the double clutching turtles go to the same spot so if i were to speculate it would be just like sea turtles essentially they're, they're going back from when you were born but i i asked sea turtle biologists and geneticists that actually discovered that in sea turtles if this would work for this population they said no they're too related for for the genes to um to know so the only thing you could do is spend your entire life tagging hatchlings finding nests tagging hatchlings and seeing if they come back i don't know i that's a lot of dedication and i i don't know if i can get there all right well thank you yep Barry, you said that like upland habitat is really important for the hatchling and for laying eggs and stuff. If if you had like an ideal buffer around every riparian area for pond turtles, like what what would you say? How much upland habitat would they have to have? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I I've been asked this often. Um, I mean, I could say that the farthest movement I have is a quarter mile, a little bit over a quarter mile. Um, so ideally that would be, you know, that's from data that I have. We could average that um, to maybe a few, like maybe 200 meters or something. Um, but I know they could go up to that distance. So I would, I would give several hundred meters a buffer for sure um, for nesting. And then has anyone um, done like a, a, you know, one of those models for ideal nesting habitat? Like if there's some criteria that the nests are found in more often than not? I, you know, like soil you know, pipe or... I don't, I don't think so. Um, maybe anecdotally, it's very hard to find nests and 
as far as I know, at the time that I did my thesis, I have found the most nests of anybody researching pond turtles, in, like in the wild, like not head starting. And that's 20 nests. So I don't know if that's enough info. But I didn't, yeah. you know, soil, soil types also going to be, you know, it's like, oh, this is a marsh, it's going to be clay. But if this pond is next to dunes or something, it's going to be sandy. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, no, I don't know if anybody's done that. I haven't seen anything like that, so. Okay, thanks. Hey, Calvin, you have a question? Yeah, um, when you collected your, your data for your thesis and you started getting more and more uh, recaptures, did you ever consider changing your bait to see whether or not that would have any effect on any of the recaptures to see if there was any food preference for certain individuals that you might've been getting over and over again with one kind of bait. And maybe if you put like chicken or something in one, if that would change anything. That's a, no, no, I didn't, but that would be, that would be a, a good like study on um, ideal bait preference, you know, to catch turtles. Um, I, I never did that. I, I pretty much stuck to the mackerel. That's an interesting thought. I think you're gonna have to start doing that for your next your next sites. Oh yeah. Sure. Maybe in preparation for your PhD. Oh my God. We're not going that route right now. I can't can't take on something like that. Oh, okay. Someone else. <laughs> Um, I do have a question. Um, so I know how you were talking about how Point Magoo only has like the adult turtles, but there isn't any any youngs. Um, so right. do you think if Point Magoo would do like, well, I mean, I haven't been to that site, but like if maybe they did some more like restoration efforts there, like they did at Aliso Creek, do you think that might try to recruit more of the youngins in? Yeah, it, it's mainly the management. Um, you know, wetlands, wetlands get wetland vegetation. Yeah, if you have a rundo, that really wipes it out or tamarisk or something. Um, but um, over there, it's mainly the way they're managing the ponds. What I think happened there, um, I think they were surviving in an old golf golf course, and then they on on the navy base, and then they closed the golf course and drained and then stopped managing the ponds for the water features and then those turtles left and just went into the tidal creeks now adults you know they're pretty hardy and stuff so they would you know nothing really eats adults you know in that kind of situation um but i think if so that you know when they went in these tidal creeks there would just was no vegetation they keep they kept mowing it the bulrush they keep mowing it so i wonder if they would just give them some bulrush um but I think it should also be like, if you knew where the nests were, then maybe you could manage for like, you know, let's assume that the turtles walk to the closest part of the creek and, and they're in that habitat, um, hiding in there that could increase survivorship. I mean, it takes years though for them to like survive, like four years to get good survivorship. Restoration of those banks will definitely um, increase survivorship though. Okay, thank you, Barry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Does anyone else have any questions for Barry? Is there an economic value to capturing the pond turtles? Do they show up in aquariums or in? No. So they're 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 uh, they're they're protected, so they cannot be collected for um, pets. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank yep. Okay. Well, right, if okay. anyone else does not have any questions for Barry, thank you for giving a talk today. Definitely a lot of knowledge that uh, was given out today and especially um, today on World Wetlands, I mean, World Tur Turtle Day. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the talk and, um, you know, if you guys have any other questions for Barry, you know, you guys are more than welcome to reach out to Barry or myself and I could forward you guys his, uh, his email. Um, yeah. But thank you again for coming today. And you got, do you have any, 
last thoughts, Barry? Just happy World Turtle Day. Thank you for your patience with, I don't know why Zoom wasn't working. We all use it. I just kept hitting the link and it wouldn't work. So thanks for your patience and all of that. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed learning about turtles. Oh, thank you. Thanks, right, Barry. Take care. Thanks, Barry. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Anita. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. See you tomorrow.